17. We are coming, this passage will conclude the Perean ministry. Now you'll recall back in John chapter 10, Jesus was at the Feast of Dedication and was confronted by the high priest and the chief priest there about are you or are you not the Messiah? And he said, well, I've already told you and you won't believe me. But by the time he reaffirmed his messiahship, they again wanted to arrest him and he made his way from there across the Jordan River to a place called Bethany of Perea. That's the place where John the Baptist would baptize and that's where Jesus was baptized at the beginning of his ministry. So he was there and during that time, Lazarus in Bethany near Jerusalem, two cities named Bethany. There are actually three in Israel, but these two the one where Lazarus lived was two miles from Jerusalem. And he was ill, and so they sent a messenger to Jesus over here, and we saw that this covers the period around Luke chapter 13, verses 22 and following. The messenger comes all the way from Bethany of Judea to Bethany of Perea. And he tells Jesus, the one whom thou lovest is sick. And Jesus says, don't worry, this sickness is not unto death. John chapter 11 tells us about that. But he was already dead. And in the grave by the time the messenger got to him. But he knew what he was going to do. He was going to raise him from the dead. So John tells us that Jesus waited two and a half more days, two more days. And on the third day, he made that day's journey from Bethany of Perea to Bethany of Judea. And this, from Luke chapter 13, verse 20 to Luke 17, verse 10, this is what is referred to as Jesus' Perean ministry because the area was called Perea. And we've been following the confrontation, his discourses to the Pharisees, there in chapter 14, to the publicans and sinners, that's the religious lost, and well, the Pharisees and scribes too. But he dealt with the sinners that admitted they were sinners, and then the ones that didn't think they were sinners, in, this, in the parable of the prodigal son. And then we come in chapter 16, we have looked at, his teaching of, to his disciples on stewardship. Verses 1 to 13, we looked at four principles of godly stewardship. Verses uh, 14 through 18, we saw three marks of ungodly stewards. These were the Pharisees. The religious leaders of Israel, they were ungodly stewards. And then, of course, we looked at why stewardship is important in that parable of the rich man and Lazarus, verses 19 to 31. Before he departs back to Jerusalem, or Bethany, to raise Lazarus from the grave, he gives one more lesson to his disciples. And this is about four essential attitudes of stewardship. Four essential attitudes of stewardship. You want to be a disciple of Christ? You want to be a steward of the things of the Lord? There are four attitudes that are essential for you to have as a steward of God. So we see there, read with me verses 1 through 10 of Luke chapter 17. Then said he unto the disciples, It is impossible but that offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast, he cast into the sea, than he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves, if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, and if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, seven times in a day, turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And the apostle said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. And the Lord said, If ye had faith as a grain of mustard seed, Ye might say unto this sycamine tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be planted in the sea, and it should obey you. But which of you, having a servant, plowing in, or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by, when he has come from the field, Go and sit down to meat? And will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me until I have eaten and drunken? And afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded of him? I trow not, or I suppose not. 
So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Let's pray. Father, as we open your word, we ask that your spirit would open our hearts, our ears, our minds to understand, and then, Lord, to obey that which you would speak to us today. Mold us through your message into the image and likeness of Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Four essential attitudes of this. We have seen, we, we saw throughout chapter 16 in the last three messages that the Pharisees and scribes, those to whom the stewardship of the things of God had been handed. In fact, Jesus reminded through the parable of the elder son who represented the Pharisees there in Luke 15, and the elder son was having his little pity party, remember? He says, you know, I have been faithful. I've never transgressed your law. I have been loyal to you all this time, and you never even gave me a little kid or a goat to have a party with my friends. But as soon as this thy son is come, who hath devoured thy living with harlots, you have killed for him the fatted calf. Remember that? How did the father respond to him? He said, he said this, verse 31 of chapter 15. He said, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. You see, those Pharisees, they were the teachers. They had access to the scrolls, to the scriptures of the Old Testament. They had access to the temple. They had access to all the things of God right there inside the work. Most Jews did not have that privilege. They just caught the crumbs that fell from these men who were perverse at that point in time. And they were fed just by the crumbs that managed to fall down to them, spiritually speaking. So they were very poor stewards. And the, the, the entirety of chapter 16 has to do with stewardship. He first starts talking to his disciples in verse 1. Then in verse 14, the Pharisees, they understand what he's saying. They start mocking him, scoffing him. And so he turns his attention to the Pharisees for the rest of the chapter. But now in chapter 17, he turns back to his disciples and he's saying to them, all right, these, there are four attitudes. I've already given you four principles. I've shown you three marks of ungodly stewards. Now I want you to see four attitudes you must have. The first of those is humility. In fact, our proposition this morning is this. Humbly exercise your stewardship. You say, well, what is my stewardship? Your stewardship is whatever God has placed in your hands to do for him. First of all, all of us carry one stewardship, and that is as children of God, we, we live godly in Christ Jesus. We obey the Spirit of God. We walk as light in this darkness so that others may see Christ in us. All of us as believers have a duty to do that. But each one of us, he will place a special gift, spiritual gift, that we are to exercise each one of us will be placed certain things of this world, a position, a relationship, possessions, whatever it is. And we are to be stewards of that for him because they belong to him. That's the whole point of the first 13 verses of chapter 16. But the attitude with which we do our stewardship. Have you ever been to a place and you, it could be a restaurant or a store, and you come up to the register or you come up to an employee and you ask them a simple question. You're asking for assistance or help or you want to place your order. And they just treat you out of the blue. They just treat you very rudely. None of you have ever had that experience, have you? And you say, whoa, what did I do to you, right? And then you, you begin saying, well, you know what? They, they just get that attitude. I just don't care. I'm doing this. It's my job. I need a paycheck. And I'm just doing it because I have to. That's not an attitude of a steward of a disciple of, or a disciple of Christ. He wants us to have different attitudes. First of all, demonstrate humility, verses 1 and 2. He says here in verse 1, it says, Then said his disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come. Now notice this statement. He said, You need to understand, disciples, Offenses, and offense, the word offenses there is the word scandalon, which means scandalous or scandal. It refers to a temptation or a trap to sin. This is an intentional entrapment of someone to sin. There are going to be those who come to you and try to ensnare you in sin. 
They're going to try to trip you up. They've already tried to do this with Jesus for almost three and a half years now of his public ministry. And now that they were doing it again in chapter 16, he comes and he says, look, be aware these offenses will come. But look at two things. Number one, the inevitability of the offense. He says, it is impossible, but that they will come. If you are a disciple of Christ, if you are a follower of Jesus, expect trials and tribulations, ex expect temptations to sin. Now, there are two directions that's going to come from, and he, he's alerting us here. Be careful. He says, they will come to you from others. That's, that's the temptations from outside. Be cautious that when they come, you do not because of anger, because of your flesh, because of any other thing, do not respond and give in to them. Now, how do we do that? Have you ever seen somebody that had this attitude about their Christian life? Hey, I got this. Lord, you go help somebody else who's weaker because I've got this. That's, that's the sort of thing that goes just before fall. Humility tells us we need God's help, number one, not to fall into temptation. But then there's a second aspect of it. Notice that phrase, woe unto him through whom they come. Any time in the Old Testament, woe is an Old Testament word for judgment. It announces judgment. Woe unto him. When you see the word woe, it's like what we say nowadays when we stop and say, whoa, what just happened? You know. But this woe was far more severe than it's astonishment. This was a judgment. And when Jesus said, woe unto him through whom they come. He specifies a little more about that. It is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. A millstone, it, it, there were different sizes. Some families might have one, but th this would be a large stone cut into usually a circle. And there would be a pole put in, in it and fixed. And most of the time, an animal would push it around on top of other stones where it would crush the wheat. Very heavy stone. You know, a cinder block would be light by comparison. Now imagine someone taking a big cinder block and hanging it around your neck and then throwing you into the sea. Well, you will sink to the bottom very quickly. And what he's saying is it would be better that you be dead and banished from the face of the earth, than that you tempt one of my children into sin. Do you think God takes sin seriously? This attitude in churches today and among Christians today that, hey, God is merciful, God is gracious, God is loving, he knows I'm a sinner, he just understands and he tolerates my sin. That's not scriptural. God takes sin very seriously. But notice, it's sort of like the contrast. Sometimes the laws for those who do drugs, they can be severe. They're not anymore. They haven't been enforcing them, put it that way. But then there, we used to have far more severe laws for those who trafficked drugs and sold them to people who then did them. This punishment used to be far more severe than this one. And that is sort of what Jesus is saying here. You be careful that you're not the one through whom the temptation comes we need to be humble enough to know this number one we need the lord's help to not fall into temptation but also we need the lord's help as he's talking to leaders here in fact the ones who are going to respond in verse five are the apostles that's the 12 he has selected to be those who would begin the church in acts chapter two of course judas would be replaced but uh these were men who would be leaders he said, don't you be the ones like the Pharisees are, leading people into sin. Making them, as he said in another passage, make, making them twice the children of hell because of their false teaching. You be careful that you're not the one through whom it comes. How do we do that? Well, false teachers do that. When we teach a gospel other than that of the scriptures, or we teach principles other than those found in the scriptures, and here's another thing, folks. My dad, when we were at the Bible school in Brazil, and any time we were asked to develop the bylaws and constitution and statement of faith for a mission that they were beginning down in our, in our town, 
and it would be to serve churches all over Brazil. And the first missionary was coming out of our church to go with them. They had already said, he's going to be our first missionary. And as pastors, we said, wait a second, where's your doctrinal statement? We haven't seen your doctrinal statement. Oh, we don't have that ready yet. Where are your principles and practices? Where are your constitution and Bible? Oh, we don't have those ready yet. But we've got a mission, and we want him to be our first missionary. So they kind of asked him to develop that for them. And he did. And one of the things, I remember this statement and never forgot it. When the pastors got together to go over this and to discuss the Constitution, and especially the Articles of Faith, he said it's more important sometimes not just to look at what is in the Statement of Faith, but look at what's left out. What is left out will often tell you more about that organization than what they put in. And we have to be very careful. You know, false teachers can be false teachers not by what they say, but what they do not preach on. You can go to churches today. There are churches that won't preach on sin, won't preach on hell, won't preach on death. They won't preach on, they just make you want to feel warm and fuzzy. You had a rough week. We want you to come here and feel good. But Paul told the Ephesian elders, you preach the whole counsel of God. The comforting passages, the, the blessing passages, those that bring hope about the life that is to come. And you preach the truth about sin and hell and the consequences of that. We cannot pick and choose. That's why one of the ways I like to do is go through the Bible verse by verse. And when you do that, when you come to the passage, you preach it. You don't skip over it. You don't explain it away. You preach it as God said it. It's that simple. You can tempt people to sin by not telling them what the scripture says. You can also, they're, they're bitter Christians. I've seen bitter Christians that come and they sin by, by not doing what we're going to look at next. They have become offended and they are not going to forgive that. And so then they want their other family members to join them in their offense. Who, whose side are you going to take on this? Rather than be humble and acknowledge they're wrong, they then tempt others to sin with them against someone else. That is dangerous. Christians can be guilty. Notice he didn't separate this as, as believers or unbelievers. Whether it be believer or unbeliever, the consequences of doing this are very severe. And also, of course, we have wicked unbelievers. Folks, you don't have to do anything but look on the news today. What is going on in our nation? What used to be a nation under God, founded on Christian principles? Today it mocks God and shakes its fist in the face of God. And I'm telling you, it's, America will not stand without judgment. God will judge. That's why Brother Dusty, remember how he had prayed, Lord, have mercy on America. He stopped praying, God bless America, because until America repents and turns from its sin, there's hard, it's hard to ask God to bless that. But he said, remember mercy. From Haggai, I believe it is. There are wicked unbelievers out there. That as Roman 1, look at the Roman 1 downward spiral, beginning in verse 18 and going all the way to the end of the chapter. And then God gives them up. God gives them up and God gives them over to a reprobate mind. And then as you get to the last verse, it said, these are those who, knowing that this brings death and judgment, not only do they do these things, but they take pleasure in them who do. And we see our media today celebrating all the things that God calls an abomination. And they reject the things of God. Those are bigoted. Those are defamatory. And, all the, and we're put into a box to where if you want to have your faith, you do it off over there somewhere where nobody can see it and aren't offended by it. Who would have believed we'd have a day in which our largest schools in America, the most famed and respected schools, would defend a terrorist organization over Israel, the people of God? It's hard to believe that we have come that far. Woe unto them through whom these temptations come. We need humility to know that we need the help of the Lord. Second, we need the spirit or a, a, a spirit that grants forgiveness, an attitude of forgiveness. 
Notice verses 3 and 4. It said, take heed to yourselves. Now notice this. He said, you watch out for you. Now a lot of times we say, well, I'm okay, but I'm keeping an eye on everybody else. If they step out of line, buddy, they've had it. No, humility doesn't do that. Humility realizes, hey, I'm a sinner, and I have a sin nature, and if it's not by the grace of God and the help of God, I will fall into sin and perhaps tempt others to sin with me. So he says, you take heed, you watch out for yourself, first of all. Notice that warning. If your brother trespasses again, this is another believer, okay? If your brother sins against you, the word trespass is hamartion, which is sin. So he sins against you. What do you do? You rebuke him. And if he repents, you forgive him. This is an interesting thing. Notice here, first of all, the direction of forgiveness. Sometimes when someone offends me, you say, well, he can come and apologize. I'm not going to him. I'm not forgiving him until he makes it right. That's not the direction of forgiveness. You have to, all you have to do is go back to what God did. Adam and Eve sinned against God, and then they hid. Who came and sought them out? God sought them out. The New Testament it tells us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. His forgiveness was initiated on his side. So you be careful of yourselves. You be humble enough, no matter who offended you, no matter how much they hurt you, no matter how much they shamed you, you be ready to forgive. Notice what it says here. Secondly, that's the direction of forgiveness. From the offended to the offender. What are the elements of forgiveness? Well, there's the offense itself. It's a sin. It's a trespass. Hamartion. But secondly, there's rebuke. This is something we don't like to do, isn't it? So-and-so sinned against me. Well, you know what? Just leave it alone. I don't, I, you know, if you confront, then they're going to react, and there's this and that and the other, and I, I just don't want to deal with all that. Now, this is obviously not talking about just everyday trivial stuff. Sometimes you don't even know they did it. That you forgive. But this is talking about a, a clear, open sin that needs to be corrected. Because until it's corrected, that brother is out of fellowship with the Lord. And until he repents of that and restores fellowship, then he is walking in sin. And if we, who are spiritual, Galatians chapter 6, do not go and rebuke that, that one. And the word rebuke here, it means to admonish him sharply. This is not just, hey, I know you didn't mean to do this. I know, and you know, we're not saying anything, but no, say what you're saying. What you did was wrong, and it was sin. And as a brother in Christ, I don't want to see you walking in sin. I want to see you in fellowship with the Lord, because if you're not in fellowship with him, you can't be in fellowship with me. And that's a, that is love. That's humility. It's not going to him as one who is superior and prideful. It's going to him, you take heed, first of all, to yourself, and then you go. Galatians 6 says, you which are spiritual, walking in the spirit, you go and you rebuke. And then finally, there is the desire. We've, we saw this all throughout chapter 15. The desire is that they repent. What does repentance mean? It's a 180 degree turn. You turn away from the wrong and you go back to what's right. You cannot say, okay, Lord, forgive me. I'm sorry. And keep doing what you're doing. That is continuing in sin. That's not repentance. By the very definition of repentance. There are these three, and then there's the fourth element. Then you forgive him. You see, Jesus died on that cross. And there are some people that believe, hey, he died for my sins, and that because he died for the sins of the world, hey, I'm part of the world, I'm going to heaven. So I, can, I don't have to go to church. I don't have to abandon my sin. God's not going to send me to hell. He's a loving God. He died for my sins. And just live life here and hope for the best when you get to heaven. It's not the way it works. God sent his son. He offered forgiveness. He rebukes our sin through preaching. We first must be lost. Remember chapter 15. He's lost. He's found. There's rejoicing. And then the, the application. There's rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who does what? Repents. That's the key to all of this. There has to be the repentance. Otherwise, while the forgiveness is there and you are ready to offer it and give it, 
until the repentance is there, it can't be, the, that, that transaction is not concluded. While you have offered it and your spirit is that of forgiving the whole time. This is not, if they do not repent, it's not an excuse for you to become bitter against them. Like God, you offer that forgiveness and you leave the offer on the table. At any moment that they repent and they come, you forgive them. Okay? Spirit of humility. <laughs> to, to get to forgiveness, it first takes humility. We do not tempt others and we are not tempted by others to sin. We need God's help for that. Secondly, we forgive. And notice how many times do you forgive? Verse 4. If he trespass against you seven times in a day, seven times a day turn again to thee saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Now, I don't know about you, but if somebody does one thing to deliberately offend me, and I go to them and say, hey, and then he turns right around and does it again, how many of us would go back a second time? A third time? Fourth time? Fifth, sixth, seventh. Remember what he said back in Matthew 18 when he spoke on forgiveness in the church and that sort of thing. When you confront, take, you go, then you take a brother, then you bring it before the church. And then Peter asked the question, Lord, how many times do we forgive someone? Seven times? And he thought he was being magnanimous. The law, the law according to the traditions of the Pharisees, only required in one case three times, and in another case up to five times. Peter says, Lord, do we do it seven times? And the Lord said, no, I don't say seven times. I say 70 times seven. 490 times? Well, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is you keep forgiving. For Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, I believe it is. It says, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. How does God forgive us? Readily, repeatedly. How many times have we sinned the same sin against him? Aren't you glad he doesn't stop at 490? I sure am. Well, humility, forgiveness. There's a third attitude that we must recognize. We have to exercise faith. Verse 5, the apostles. Now notice the disciples was a larger group. These are some that followed Jesus, believed on him. Some were still deciding, am I going to believe him or not? They're still following him. But the apostles are those 12 that we studied about back in Matthew chapter 10. Those that he separated, and they walked with him for three and a half years, and then they were the ones there in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost that were there all but Judas. And the church began. These are those 12. The apostles said this, said, Lord, increase our faith. Humility realizes that I can't do this in and of myself, and I need help. And first of all, notice the source that they went to. They said, Lord, our faith can only be strengthened by the Lord, by his word, by his faithfulness. And as we obey him, and he reassures that by carrying out his side of things, as he promised he would. Our faith is increased. Our faith is strengthened. But they realize, you know, these apostles, and I imagine Peter as the spokesman probably spoke up like he did in Matthew 18. He said, Lord, we, we need more faith for that. You know, that. That is not human nature to do this. But, you know, if we read the word of God and we understand the word of God, then that's what we do. We practice the word of God. And with the Spirit, we now have the Spirit indwelling us. At this point in time, they did not increase our faith. So we see the source of that. But also look at the request. Lord, give us more faith. Sometimes we think that we come to a point in life, as the Pharisees had, that we've got our system down, we've done all the works, we've got all the position, the recognition, we've got the system down to a science, we're there. We're in. We're sons of Abraham. We're keeping the law. And we're getting after all those who don't. And we're going to heaven. And back in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus in his, as we would call it, the inaugural address of his earthly ministry. Chapter 5, verse 20 says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. 
you can't be saved. So we have to understand these things are by faith alone, and that comes from the Lord. Now, what does Jesus say? He says, if you had the faith of a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto this sycamine tree, that's a mulberry tree. It's not a sycamore tree. It says sycamine, but that, this is actually referring to a, a mulberry tree. So, be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. The story is about this young boy. He had to do his chores around the farm, and of course he was told to go out there and weed the garden. And he had been to Sunday school, and they had read this verse, and he said, okay, Lord, I'm going to try this out. And he started telling the weeds, you'd be plucked up and it didn't work. And he came back to his mom and says, the Bible's wrong. I tried that plucked up by the, by the root thing. And it didn't work. Well, we remember when we increase our faith, we also understand that we must pray according to the will of God. We must act and exercise our faith according to the will of God. Now, I know about a church. Remember, that's the same principle. He was there near a mulberry tree, so he used that. Another time, he's near a mountain, and he'll say, you say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and it will be removed. Brother Neil Smith, one of the missionaries in Brazil, told us the story of a church that out in, I believe it was Oregon. Either it's Northern California or Oregon. And the church had been there for many years. It, like ours, had a gravel parking lot. It was a small church. But they had passed new regulations that your church, if you, based on the number of people you can seat in your church, you must have so much paved parking in your parking lot to accommodate those people, or you shut down. And this church, they had no funds for this. It's very much like ours. Small group of believers serving the Lord, worshiping the Lord, growing together. And they get this warning from the state. You must do this or shut down. They said, what do we do? They prayed. They started having prayer meetings at the church during the week, and people would come, and they began to pray, and one night they're praying, and there's a knock at the door. The pastor opens the door, and there's a man in a hard hat there, and he says, listen, we're building this I think it was a mall or something down here, and we need tons and tons of field dirt. You see, behind this church, the reason they didn't have much parking was there was a mountain, a hillside that went up. And he said, listen, could we buy the dirt from you, from this mountain back here? Could we do it, and we'll haul it, and as a thank you, we'll clean up the mess, and we'll pave your parking lot for you. And God answered the prayer, and they continued on so far. You see, you pray according to the will of God. Now, who, humanly speaking, would have said, not only will we have it done, but it's going to be given to us by the Lord free of charge. You see, you can pray. Do, you, do we have the faith in God that he has called me to do this, he has led me to do this, and I'm going to trust him to give me the words, give me the strength, give me the resources, give me whatever it takes to do what I know he wants me to do. And then we step out believing he's going to do that. Do we have that kind of faith? I confess there are times I don't. I look at everything you said and say, Lord, okay, we don't have the resource, so I guess it's not your will. Not always is that the case. You go until he closes the door. And then you make sure that that is a closed door. We need to exercise faith. That's the attitude of humility, the attitude of forgiveness, the attitude that I'm going to exercise my faith according to the word and will of God, and I'm going to trust him for the results. I can't do it, but he can. And fourthly, we fulfill our duty. The attitude, now not the attitude that, well, I have to do this, so I'll do it, and we begrudgingly do it. No, your fulfillment is in fulfilling your duty. Look at verses 7 to 10. There's a parable in verses 7 to 9. And in the parable, he, he creates a relationship to where his disciples, his apostles, they are the masters who have, and the word here for servant is 
doulos is the word slave. So he, he basically belongs to the master, and he must do whatever the master commands him to do. So imagine that relationship. You're the master. You say to a servant. Now here he says, you have a servant plowing or feeding cattle, whatever he's doing on the farm. He works all day. And you will say to him by and by when he has come from the field, go and sit down. To, hey, you've been working hard. You've been out in the hot sun all day. You go sit down. I'm, I'm, I'm going to prepare your dinner. You, you take a rest. And what he's saying, he's creating a scenario. He said, no one on earth does that. No human master does that for their servant. And then in verse 8, he goes on a step further. Not only the relationship there, but also look at the roles. And he would not, now he will rather say, this is more like it. You make ready wherewith I may sup. You, you get my supper ready, and you get yourself cleaned up. You gird yourself. You dress appropriately for it. And then, when you serve me, and I've eaten and drunk, I, I'm satisfied, I'm finished. Afterward, thou shalt eat and drink. That was, the, that was the custom among human masters and servants. That is the way it was. That's what was expected. That's why he says, which one of you would do this? And the answer is, none of them would. Nobody would do that. Which I would, I, and will not rather say, who would actually do this? Say, so, yeah, everybody does that. They're familiar with that scenario. So you have the relationship and then the roles of who is the master, who is the servant. And then look at the expectations or the, real, or the reward. Doth he thank the servant because he did the things that were commanded of him? I trow not. I suppose not. Don't think so. You know, in Egypt as we'd go, one of the things you learn about that culture, most of the Middle Eastern cultures, is whenever you go to a place and you are the guest or you are the customer, then they are there to serve you. And generally, they will not look in the eyes of that person. They will not call that person by name. They will speak at them rather than to them. And I'm talking about a lot of the Christians as well. And so as we would go in and gather there at the Le Passage Hotel before traveling out to Alexandria five hours away, I would sit there and I'd observe these things, even among some of the people that worked with us from Egypt, and it just disturbed me. I said, this is a human being. This is a person created in the image and likeness of God to whom we are to show the love of Christ. And it bothered me when they would speak at them rather than to them and never acknowledge their name. And one of the things I began to do, I just, they had a name tag and it was spelled in English, not Arabic, most of the time. And I would just acknowledge them by the name and thank them when they brought the coffee or whatever they brought. I would say, thank you. And at first I thought, goodness, they, they, they reacted in such ways that they were so pleased by that. The next morning when I'd come in to breakfast, they'd say, good morning, Mr. Kenneth. I said, good morning. You see, it made an impression. That is not normal in that part of the world because they are not used. They figure my job is to do this, and if I don't get any thanks for it, that's what's expected. You don't have those expectations. There is no reward to the, to the servant that way. In verse 9, verse 10, look at the realization. That means your fulfillment. Be satisfied with this. So likewise ye. Now he's bringing this around. And he's telling his apostles, you are the servants of Almighty God. You are here to do his will just as I am here to do his will. You are here to go where he tells you to go, do what he tells you to do, and suffer what he tells you to suffer. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded of you. What do you say? Well, Lord, I want you to thank me. I want you to at least prepare me a meal. I'm tired. So no, you say we are unprofitable, unworthy slaves. We have done that which was our duty to do. Lord, we've done no more than what we should have done for you. After all that God did in forgiving us of our sins, of sending Christ to die on the cross of Calvary in our place, 
You don't look like the Pharisees and you think of what everybody owes you. You think, Lord, I should be on my way to hell right now, if not already in hell. I don't deserve forgiveness. I don't deserve grace. I certainly don't deserve a home in heaven. Now see, this is the distinction between a child of God who serves God. Paul called himself a doulos of the Lord Jesus Christ, a bond slave. But when we get to heaven, we will be rewarded for the things that we were faithful in doing here. These slaves had no expectation of that. Our master will reward us for faithfulness and give us those rewards. So the attitude with which we serve is not what can we get from men, the recognition from men, the praise of men. Our attitude with which we serve is, first of all, humility. We do not tempt others, or we do not fall into temptation. And we need the Lord's help for that. It is an attitude of ready and willing and repeated forgiveness when people sin against us. It's an attitude of recognizing that we need our faith increased by the Lord to do these things. And it's an attitude that whatever the Lord sends our way, it is our duty to do. It's not, hey, he's lucky he has me. Or he had better do something for me since I did this for him. You know, I, I've been walking with the Lord. I've been going to church all these years, and the Lord hadn't done anything for me. Seems like the more I serve him, the more trials come. Well, look at poor old Job. Paul, Peter, John, and all of those 12 disciples, quite frankly. When you study about the ways in which they died for their Lord, when he told them, that that would be the case. Yet they were faithful to the death. Are we going to be stewards of Christ? Disciples of Christ? These are four essential attitudes we must have. Humility, forgiveness, faith, and duty. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your forgiveness. Lord, we thank you for the fact that you have saved us. And not only have you saved us from our sins and delivered us from eternity in hell, but Lord, you loved us and made us a child of God. You gave us the assurance of a home in heaven. You gave us the assurance of sins forgiven and a relationship with you. And then on top of all that, Lord, you will reward us for our faithfulness that we may lay those crowns at the feet of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, what a privilege to be your disciple, your servant, your slave. May we have that attitude that pleases and honors you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.